Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our service here tonight at the Tron. If you're visiting with us, then let me uh, warmly welcome you indeed to our fellowship here. And indeed, we have uh, some special visitors this evening, all the way from the land of the Ur Ukraine, often in the news and often in our prayers. But we're very delighted this evening to have two brothers who work with Scripture Union in Ukraine, Tima and Andre. And uh, they're with us, and uh, yeah, stand up, brothers. <laughs> and, uh, they've been across in this country for a couple of weeks at various meetings and uh, uh, to do with the partnership that SU in Scotland has with uh, SU in the Ukraine. And so in uh, a little while, we're going to have the chance to hear from them and hear a little more about their work and uh, the situation in the Ukraine. But you're very welcome indeed. Welcome in the Lord's name. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us. Well, we're going to begin by singing. You'll find it in these uh, blue books at number 480, 480. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne.
Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we bow in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and the King, now crowned Son of God, Lord of life, Lord of love and peace, Lord of the years, the past, the present, and the future, the King for whose coming we wait and whose glory will one day fill this whole earth. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, that even today, on this day, we are able to sing his praise because you have opened our eyes to see his glory, his splendor, his majesty. That he is the one crowned and that he is the one worthy of all of our praise. We praise you, Lord, for your gospel, which has opened our eyes and our hearts to this truth that is at the very heart of this universe. And we praise and thank you for your great mercy and for your great love to us that while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies, while we were still afar off, you've called us to yourself through your sovereign gift of grace, your wonderful purposes of love. You have taken away the blindness that was ours by nature and you have enabled us to see the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you that all over this world today, despite its darkness, despite its sorrows, its sinfulness, its rebellion against you, all over the world today, this same gospel, the gospel of your Son, is bearing fruit and advancing. That you are calling men and women and boys and girls into the life that is theirs afresh in Jesus Christ. That by your Holy Spirit, your gospel is going forth to people of every tribe and tongue and nation. We thank you, Lord, tonight for the reminder of the worldwide reach of your glorious kingdom. We thank you for bringing our brothers from that war-torn land of Ukraine. We thank you for the fellowship that we have with them and the bonds that we share, though we have met only the first time this evening because we're part of your family. And so it is, Lord, for others here tonight from Iran, from Syria, from Afghanistan, from China, from other parts of Southeast Asia, from other countries all over this world. We here represent tonight a foretaste of the glorious reality that will one day be revealed when Jesus comes. Now there will be truly people of every tribe and nation and tongue praising you through Jesus Christ, the same Saviour, who is Lord of all. So, Lord, you we worship, you we exalt and glorify, you we will sing of, and you we will serve with all of our life and all of our breath. We need your help, Lord. We need your strengthening, your encouraging. We know our weakness. We know our propensity to drift, to turn aside to easier ways, to paths of peace that would keep us out of the fight, the battles, the many things that would assail us if we would be true to you all the days of our lives. Lord, guard us and keep us, we pray. We thank you that in Jesus Christ, our Savior, we have a great high priest who is able to help us. He knows our weaknesses. He has walked our path. He is the one who knows us better even than we know ourselves. And so as we come to him offering our prayers, we have great confidence and our hearts are lightened because we know that by praying in his name, so also he adds his weight, his power, his authority, his might to all our humble and feeble prayers. And he is for us a great and true high priest at the throne of grace, pleading for us. 
but by the power of his blood shed for our sins, he will keep us and guard us until the great day. So, Lord, in his name we come before you this evening, asking your blessing upon our meeting, asking your presence to be in our midst, that we might know you more, and that we might go from here strengthened and blessed, encouraged, hearts lifted up, and ready to serve you the better this coming week. So hear us, Lord, in this our evening prayer. Draw near to us as we draw near to you in faith, for we ask it in Jesus Christ, our Saviour's name. Amen. <coughs> one or two notices this evening. If you didn't get one of these uh, this morning or uh, on the way in this evening, pick them up uh, on the shelves outside. Uh, one or two things to draw to your attention. As we said this morning, um, we are looking forward very much to the first Churches Conference for the West of Scotland Gospel Partnership, which uh, should be happening here on Saturday the 7th of March. There are these flyers uh, outside. If you haven't picked one up, uh, do get one. Uh, it tells you all about the conference. The main speaker is going to be Philip Jensen from Sydney in Australia. Philip has been with us before. We had a superb conference with him a few years ago. And those of you who remember will uh, no doubt uh, be wanting to be there again this time. If you weren't there last time, this is your chance. So book up, get one of these, and it uh, tells you how to book either by the paper here. You can give these into the church office here, or you can book online. But don't leave it too late. It's cheaper before the end of January, so I'm telling you, and uh, I can't guarantee that if you leave it too late there will be a place because there'll be a lot of people wanting to come. So get in early, be unlike yourselves as uh, lastminute.tron, did you know that's what we call you? <laughs> yes, lastminute.tron, that's your nickname for things like this. So be different this time and get in early and uh, don't miss out. <coughs> then just to remind you to keep these by you uh, through the week to help you remember what's going on in the life of the church and pray together. Uh, as a fellowship so that we can pray for the work of Christ uh, going on all this week. Don't forget the Wednesday lunchtime service, the various uh, home groups meeting, and uh, also especially Christianity Explored on Friday evening. It's the second week of that course about uh, the basics of the Christian faith. If you want to find out more, if you want to find out who Jesus really said he was, what he said, what he did, this is the course for you. It's just the second week this week. It's not too late to join in. And it's not too late if you've got somebody that you think that's just the right thing for. Bring them along uh, on Friday evening. They'll be very, very welcome indeed. 7.30 here uh, in the church. And again, there's cards just at the doors there that have more details about Christianity Explored if you want to find out uh, about it. We're going to sing again. And uh, number 490, before Bob comes to read God's word to us. Jesus is King. And I will extol him, give him the glory and honour his name.
Now, if we could turn, please, to our Bibles, to the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4. It's on page 103. We are continuing this series in Hebrews and reading this evening from 4.14 to 5.10. Letter to the Hebrews, chapter 4, verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honour for himself but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. May he bless it to our hearts. Now we're going to sing again, and this hymn is based on this passage, number 501, where high the heavenly temple stands, the house of God, not made with hands, a great high priest our nature wears, the guardian of mankind appears, number 501.
No, while the musicians play, we're going to take up the offering. <laughs> Let's pray. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and sending your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Father, we know how incapable we are of, of carrying on that work on our own, how impossible it is for us to make it by our own efforts. So we praise you that we have a great High Priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus, the Son of God, and in whom we can come with confidence to the throne of grace. As we have laid these gifts before you, some words from long ago from King David. David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours both riches and honour come from you, and you rule over all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able thus to offer willingly, that all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. And we are strangers before you and sojourners, as all our fathers were. Our days on earth are like a shadow, and there is none abiding. And Lord, we are very conscious of our own vulnerability. And we pray now, Lord, we pray again for our brothers who have just spoken to us in the work in Ukraine. We pray for all the varied works represented in the congregation here and throughout the world. And indeed, we pray, Lord, that we may come with confidence to the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need. This is our prayer, Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our passage speaks of, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications. We're going to sing a hymn now that reflects that. Number 433, Man of Sorrows, what a name for the Son of God, who came ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Saviour.
Now, if we could have our Bibles open, please, at Hebrews 4, that's on page 1002 and 1003, and we'll have a moment of prayer. Father, as we draw near to you, we pray that you will most graciously draw near to us, that you will open your word to our hearts and minds, and that you will open our hearts and minds to your word, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. (coughs) A pagan writer sometime in the first century said, the Christians were atheists. The reason he said this was because they didn't have any of the kind of things that a religion needed. They didn't have a temple. <clears throat> they didn't have sacrifices. They didn't, really, they didn't really worship God at all. After all, they didn't worship her Jupiter and Apollo and the other gods. And they didn't have priests. And therefore, they must be atheists. Now, it's not only, that's not the only remark of that kind. In the 17th century, King Charles I sent Archbishop Laud up here to Scotland to to impose what was called Laud's liturgy. Laud was not impressed. The weather, unsurprisingly, was appalling. The buildings, he said, were dark, dismal, and gloomy. Well, there are many still of these kind of buildings around, as we are only too well aware Indeed, he writes, the benighted people appear to have no religion at all. (laughs) Once again, looking looking for externals. One of the dreadfully unfortunate things about that ham-fisted way that both the king and the archbishop uh, went about their job was the undying suspicion sowed in the Scottish church for the glorious language of Cranmer's prayer book. That was one very, really unfortunate consequence of it. But um, this is a fallen world. So, our author is saying we do have all these things. We do have a sacrifice, a once-for-all sacrifice to which nothing can be added and which can never be repeated. We do have a temple, but it's not made with hands. The temple in heaven, after all, the earthly temple is only a copy of the things in heaven. Above all, we do have a priest. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. And this is going to become the dominant note in the rest of the letter. Each of the, each of the writers deal with the Lord Jesus Christ in different ways, but no one so fully and so powerfully deals with the high priesthood of Jesus as the author of Hebrews. He's just given a warning note that the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, warning us, as we saw last week, not to fail to enter rest. The note now becomes mainly one of encouragement, although there is warning. And of course, we need both of these, don't we? In In any ministry, in any experience, we need both warning and encouragement. If we have an overdose of relentless negatives, we're going to feel we are never going to make it, aren't we? On the other hand, if we have nothing but encouragement and affirmation, we're going to become complacent. And it seems to me rather obvious that in the Hebrew, among the Hebrew Christians to whom this letter was written, both moods were very much in evidence. There were those who were complacent, those who were holding on loosely, to the doctrines of the faith, and there were those who were totally discouraged. Now, the answer to both, says our author, is the great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Now, priests have two qualifications, and these run through this passage. For any priest, but particularly for the high priest, the first is he must be called by God. You don't volunteer to be the high priest. That's one of the things that happens when things go bad. All sorts of unsuitable people begin to push themselves forward and volunteer. We're all all aware of that. That's why somebody said, never ask for volunteers. But um, 
And one time, apparently, the former president of America, Bill Clinton, and was having a discussion with Bill Hybels, um, the, the churchman, and they were discussing who had the most difficult job. And Clinton said to Hybels, you have a far more difficult job than me, Bill. He said, why? Because you have to work with volunteers. Those of you who are volunteers, please do not take this person. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the point is, the high priest has to be called. And at one time in ancient Israel, when Jeroboam became the first king of the northern kingdom of Israel, he made the priesthood into a job. Anybody who wanted could be a priest, could apply for it. And this apparently happened, as, so I was once talking to a Christian from Sweden who said that in some parts at least of Sweden, the job is advertised in the paper. Well, it may say something vague like, you've got to have some religious kind of consciousness, but um, simply a job to be applied for, like any other job. No, it has to, he has to be called. And the other thing is there has to be true sympathy, an open heart, and a listening ear. <clears throat> and that's what our title is today, taken from the, the passage itself. It's always quite a good place to find titles, isn't it? No one can say you're twisting the passage if you find the title from the passage. Verse 16 of chapter 4, grace to help in time of need. Is there ever a time which is not a time of need? The old hymn says, is there trouble anywhere? We know very well there's trouble everywhere. And we need a great high priest to help in time of need. Now we have three snapshots, if you like, in this passage of the great high priest. First of all, his nature kind of person he is. Chapter 4, verses 14 to 16, <clears throat> as we sang a moment ago, a great high priest our nature wears. So two things. First of all, he has taken humanity into heaven. He has passed through the heavens, Jesus. He is still, in, I think it's an important thing we must never forget, Jesus in glory is still human. He is still a man. He hasn't been reabsorbed into the Godhead, whatever that phrase could mean. He, he is a man in heaven. And that, of course, tells us that we will be human as well in the new creation. We will not become disembodied spirits when we are further up and further in. I think you know who said that. In, in the new creation, we will be truly human. But not, of course, the fallen, decaying humanity we are now, but the human beings that God created us to be. When God made us, he, made, he gave us um, the qualities, the personality, obscured very often in this world, but in there, in, in the new creation, it will be truly realized. We will be truly human and Believe it or not, brothers and sisters, it's harder to imagine for some of us than others. We'll all be beautiful. <laughs> I said it's harder to imagine for some than for others, but never underestimate the grace of God and the wonder of the Creator. Now, the old high priest went into the holy place, the most sacred division of the temple, once a year, and once a year only. Whereas Jesus Christ has gone into the holy place, the true holy place, once and for all, he has passed through the heavens. <clears throat> As I said before, we often neglect the doctrine of the ascension. If we, and we, we often think about the resurrection. We often think about the coming of Jesus. Don't neglect the ascension, because the ascension is absolutely vital if we did not have the ascension, what happened to the risen Jesus when the 40 days were over, when he ceased to appear to his disciples? There's a black hole there. No. Hebrews tells us, Luke is the only gospel which describes the event in Acts and a briefer account at the end of the gospel. But here, the other Ephesians, for example, said he ascended to heaven. And here, he has passed through the heavens. Now, <clears throat> The, the heavens, of course, so the, the, the thinking here is, well, first of all, there is the aerial heavens, if you like, in which we live and in which the birds fly. There are the starry heavens, if you like, and then there is the heaven of heavens, the third heaven, sometimes the seventh heaven, the dwelling place of God himself. 
So it's not just space, it is spatial, but it is to do with, um, it's to do with coming right into the presence of God's glory. Jesus, the Son of God. <clears throat> now this is very practical. Because of this, says our author, verse 14, let us hold fast our confession. Confession is equivalent to the faith once delivered to the saints, as Jude calls it, to the gospel, to the deposit of faith we get in the pastoral letters. Hold on to this. You see, the important thing about Hebrews, and I'll say this again next week when we come to the difficult passage about falling away, as far as we can see, there is no heretical teaching troubling the Hebrews. None of that, as there were in some of the churches. These were, church, these were people who had heard the gospel over now probably two, possibly even three generations. They didn't disbelieve it. It's just they weren't holding it very closely. It wasn't part of them. It hadn't become, their, it hadn't become part of their whole being. And... Uh, our author is saying, hold on to it, because Jesus has gone into heaven, and that means your faith is secure. So he's taken humanity into heaven. Now there, of course, immediately arises a problem. He's in heaven. He's enthroned far above all might and principality and power and every name that can be named, both in this world and in the world to come, as Paul says in Ephesians does that mean he no longer cares for us? Does that mean he is too great to care, too high to be concerned? Now, our author is determined to see this. Is, notice the double negative. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize. You see, sympathy doesn't just mean kind feelings. It implies active help as well. There's no point in going to the throne of grace. If we're just going to be patting head and say, oh, you'll feel better in a little while. That's not what sympathy means. Sympathy means actively helping. Now, as we all know, that help may be slow to come. There are difficult, troubling, troubling, t lonely times, lonely agonies, and costly disciplines to be endured. But this high priest is not too high not throned above, remotely high, unmoved, untouched by human cares, as another hymn says. No, he has... I, notice that, I want to see how astonishing this is. He is in every respect tempted as we are. As we wrestle with temptation as the, sometimes the foulest and nastiest thoughts come into our head, nasty pictures on the screen of our minds. Do you realize what our author is saying? Our author is saying these are not in themselves sinful. It is not sinful to be tempted. If the Son of God, who was without sin, was tempted then temptation is not sin, any more than a disposition is sin in itself. You know, if people have a disposition towards a particular type of sexuality, that is not a sin. The sin happens when we give way to these temptations, when we say, I've got this kind of disposition, so I can do nothing about it. When we say, I'm too weak, you don't know the pressure on me, that is when the sin happens. Now, as Jesus Christ lived our life in the midst of this world with all its temptations. Sometimes we, we, we tend to think of the Bible as a kind of primitive sort of community where every life was simple and straightforward. And indeed, sometimes there have been some presentations of the gospel that have given credence to that. No, it, is ter it was a place of grim, terrifying, relentless temptation we see, of course, it dramatized in the temptation in the desert when the devil comes to Jesus, tempting him to all these, these kind of things. See, we've got to hold both. If we simply say he was tempted in every way as we are, if we press that too far, then we're likely to end up feeling, oh, well, he's not really all that different from me at all. He's as weak as I am. But notice, without sin... In other words, 
he does sympathise with us. He does totally identify with us, but not sin. You see, if he had sinned, then his sins would have had to have been forgiven. And who then was going to stand between any of us and the anger of God? How, how was the salvation of humanity to be accomplished? So a temptation itself is neutral. Be it how we respond to temptation. When, and when we struggle, our author is saying he knows what we're going through. Remember that the next time we struggle. It's terrifying, but there is someone who has not only reached the goal, but who is alongside to help us. Someone who is not going to be insinuating nasty, nasty thoughts like, if you really were a Christian, you wouldn't be tempted to this. That's not the voice of the great high priest. That's the voice of the tempter. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, of course there's guilt within. You see, sometimes people have asked, what's the difference between being convicted by the Holy Spirit of something sinful and being driven to despair by the devil's temptations? I think the answer is, and I think the answer is something like this. When the devil speaks to us of our sins, he drives us into the dust. He says, you'll never make it, you've blown it. No, you'll never, you'll never appear before the Lord at all. He doesn't want to have anything to do with anyone like you. Tempts us to despair. But when the Holy Spirit convicts us, the Holy Spirit shows us what to do about it. He says, yes, there's a sin, something's got to be done about it, and he shows us what to do about it. Now, that is the huge difference. You see, we are all, to the very end of our journey, going to be harassed by sin. I preach of an earlier generation, Alexander McLaren, in the colourful language of an earlier generation, says, the hounds of hell will pursue us to the very gates of heaven and leave their teeth marks on the golden gates. Now, that's a very vivid way of putting it, and I say it's uh, not the language of this generation, but it makes the point very powerfully. He goes to the throne of grace, and because of that, we can, as Wesley says, bold I approach the eternal throne. As younger, I think it's a very arrogant thing to sing. I don't think that now. I realize as I get older how sinful I am and how I will never approach the eternal throne other than through Christ. Remember he says, claim the crown through Christ, my own. Just one other thing here. Notice it's a throne of grace. Thrones are normally associated with judgment, and of course it is a judgment seat, but it is a judgment seat on which sits the great high priest, Jesus the one who identifies with us, and also the Son of God, the one who can rescue us. So, his nature, the great high priest, our nature, where battling himself with temptation in his earthly life, coming alongside of us to help us, and we're driven to despair. Now, the second thing is his calling, chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, the calling of the priest. And once again, remember our author is rather like an artist on, on a palette making the same point in several different ways, or like a musical piece playing the, the melody in for different instruments. First thing about him is he is totally human. He is appointed from men to act on behalf of men. Verse 1, Jesus totally in continuity with Aaron in that he was human. As I, I mentioned a few weeks ago, that story of the funeral of Lord Shaftesbury, the great philanthropist and the man who said of Shaftesbury, he was one of us. It's a message of Hebrews. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is one of us. He was appointed from among us to act on our behalf. I mean, after all, it's a very simple definition of a priest, isn't it? The priest brings God to people and people to God. That is what priests were for. And the gifts and sacrifices um, um, are probably a general description of the offerings which the high priest, over which the high priest presided. 
Now, there were many priests in ancient Israel who were thoroughly disreputable and unworthy. No worse example at the beginning of the book of Samuel when Eli, Eli was not a bad man, Eli was a weak man, but his sons were utterly, utterly vicious, disgraced their office, deliberately, deliberately um, polluted the sanctuary and deliberately led people away from God. Just as there were dreadful kings. The point is, of course, these priests failed, the kings failed, even the best, and even the best of the priests failed but, and even the best of the kings. But verse 2 shows something very, he can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since, since he himself is beset with weakness. Now, he's particularly talking about Aaron here, of course. Aaron and the other priests had to give sacrifices for their sins. And that is why one of the titles of Jesus, the friend of sinners, is such a wonderful and encouraging title. He is the friend of sinners. And because he is the friend of sinners, we can claim his friendship. So he's totally human. And he can either, but he's also totally chosen by God. Now, even the best of the high priests, they said, verse 3, had to offer sacrifice for their own sins. And they were supposed to live godly lives, many of them totally unworthy like Eli's sons, but even the best of them were fallible. In Leviticus 17, great day of atonement, which is the background to so much of this letter, Aaron goes into the holy place and offers first sacrifices for his own sins. But the main point here is the divine calling. Aaron had this special call, called by God, just as Aaron was. Calling, if it's truly grass, leads not to pride, but to humility. Not something to grasp at. Remember the great passage in Philippians 2, though he was in the form of God, he did not grasp at his divinity, but made himself nothing and took the form of a servant. So here he does not exalt himself to be made a high priest. And once again, our author is turning to the Scriptures, two quotations from the Psalms again. Psalm 2, you are my son, you are the Davidic king, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. And then a theme which is going to become particularly prominent later on, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Read back in, Gen in Genesis where Abraham having um, rescued his nephew Lot from the kings, on his way from returning from the battle, meets Melchizedek, king of Salem. King, and Melchizedek offers him bread and wine. Look at that passage later when we come to chapter 7, which deals a bit with Melchizedek in detail. The point about Melchizedek is that the author says he is like the Son of God, because he is neither father nor mother. It doesn't mean he actually didn't literally have a father and a mother. It means that his father and mother are not recorded. The grace of God, even before the giving of the law, is stretching out. So Melchizedek comes and offers bread and wine, whereas the king of Sodom offers material wealth to Abraham. Abraham realizes that he's not going to have any obligations to Sodom, but he recognizes in Melchizedek, somebody greater than Melchizedek. So, so, so you see, Jesus is called, called as a king, called as a priest. So this is, this is, the, this is the high priest who cares for us. Now, I don't know, some of you may have read that powerful novel by Thomas Hardy, depressing novel, Tess of the D'Urbervilles, I used to love Thomas Hardy when I was young. We used to teach him as an English teacher. I remember writing at the end of Jude the Obscure, Never Again. <laughs> Such a depressing book. But in Tess of the Derby Hills, Tess, through a series, of, a series of incidents, partly her own fault, partly the fault of others, is eventually hanged. And Hardy ends the novel, The President of the Immortals, had ended his sport with Tess the president of the immortals, an uncaring, unfeeling, remote ruler living across leagues of superspace. 
we are not in the hands of the President of the Immortals. We are in the hands of a great high priest whose name is love. And finally, thirdly, we've, we've, seen, we, we've seen his nature, we've seen his calling, and briefly, his saving power. Chapter 5, verses 7 to 10. The days of his flesh, not that he's no longer human, but that this refers particularly to the, incar the period of the incarnation, his earthly life. And two things, his sufferings were real but temporary. He was not shielded from pressure. Now, in many ways, it must be awful to be Her Majesty, living that kind of life in a gilded cage. But I'm sure sometimes when you're waiting in a queue at an airport or something, you're wishing you were Her Majesty or somebody like that and could just jump to the, the head of the queue. Jesus, in his earthly life, did not jump to the head of the queue. He was not shielded from everyday life. But I think there's a particular event referred to here. The language here almost certainly refers to the Garden of Gethsemane, loud cries and tears. This passage where the Lord Jesus Christ faces death and faces it with trembling. This is amazing. Think of the great heroes of the faith, people like the Oxford martyrs, Ridley and Latimer, for example, burning for their faith during the reign of Bloody Mary, and Latimer saying, Ridley, play up and play the man, and today, by God's grace, we will light in England a candle that will never be put out. Why is it that the Lord Jesus Christ, faced with death, seemed to face it with shrinking and shrinking and trembling. I think this was part of his identification with us as a great high priest, the one who bears our nature. On that terrible night, he chose to face that experience, not like one of the heroes of his army, not like the Ridleys and Latimers, but like the poorest and weakest and most trembling of his followers. That seems to me to be absolutely wonderful. You don't have to be a hero or a heroine to know his grace and to know his presence and to know his saving power. We are told he learned obedience. And I think that's um, illuminated by a verse in Romans, Romans 5, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Standing where Adam fell, completing the work, made perfect, making the work perfect, as it is finished, completing the work, the work of redemption made perfect. And he is heard as the Son of Man because of his reverence, truly, truly human, suffering as we suffer, walking where we walk, feeling under the pressures that we do. His sufferings are real but temporary, but... A saving power is real but lasting. Verse, um, he became, verse 9, the source of eternal salvation. A high priest forever, and I think that's fascinating. That means even in the new creation, he'll still be a high priest. His hum Sometimes we think of the incarnation as if it were a kind of disreputable episode that we had to forget about. No. What? All, you know, all, uh, in the incarnation, he is showing the very heart of God, the heart of God that will not only be revealed in the rough ways of this world, but in the glories and wonders of the new creation. He will still be a priest. And notice, he is forever, he is being designated after the order of Melchizedek. And that's going to be developed in chapter 7. Aaron's priesthood was um, obviously time-limited. Other priests were time-limited. The historical Melchizedek himself was time-limited. But the one to whom he points is not. Designated by God, a high priest, he became the to all or for all who obey him. So just as we finish, he has solidarity in our weakness, his grace. But also, and this is going to be important as we go on to the next section, he helps us to persevere in faith and obedience. 
This kind of teaching does not make us complacent, or ought not to make us complacent. It shows us that when we struggle, and will continue to struggle, we can with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and grace to help in time of need. Amen. Let's pray. Through many dangerous toils and snares, we have already come in grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will bring us home. Father, we praise you for the great high priest. The great high priest will lift us up when we are fallen. The great high priest who sympathizes with us in our weakness. And the great high priest will one day meet in the very heart of the new creation, in, in the throne of God, with that same mercy and grace as he has shown to us in our earthly lives. We praise him for this. Amen. And so as we close, let's sing together Amazing Grace, number 772.
now to God our Father, whose purposes for us do not end in death, to our Lord Jesus Christ, who entered our world, that we might enter his, and to the Holy Spirit, who continually works in our hearts, preparing us for that great day, we all honour, glory, love, and dominion. May they walk with us through our lives and bring us in the light of grace to the light of glory. Amen.